State governments across the country had directed junior secondary school GSS3 students who are registered for National Examination Council and NECO Basic Education Certificate Examination BECE to resume. Many schools obeyed this directive and resumed on Monday the 10th of August of 2020. After the examinations are, were concluded, there are plans to reopen schools fully in September. But many parents and school owners and educational stakeholders are concerned about safety of their children. Joining us to have a conversation around this is Ugochi Obidiego. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning to you. Now, how schools uh, reopen Schools have reopened across the country, and many think with the easing of the lockdown, the virus is gone. But experts have advised that we continue with the safety measures, which, as you do know, uh, what should be the priority for parents at this point and schools for children who are currently writing exams, you know, amidst this sustained pandemic, if you like? Okay, so parents and teachers must emphasize training. They must emphasize that nobody should let down their guard because that is what we see happening right now. A lot of people are no more using their face masks. Some people are not even washing their hands as often anymore and they are not even maintaining social distancing. So it is the onus of parents and teachers to emphasize that we should not let down our guards. Students need to understand that they need to keep on washing their hands they need to keep on maintaining social distancing or physical distancing as it were. They should use their face mask. I know that, you know, people wear it around their necks, around, you know, in all sorts of funny places. But really, this is not the time to let down your guard because when we let down our guard, things can go wrong. Mm. So emphasis at this time is around ensuring that the school environment maintains social distancing in as many diverse and creative ways as possible. Hand washing must be provided, must be done. And so this means we need to have hand washing facilities in schools. And then, of course, we have to have sanitizing. Now, sanitizing is not a substitute for hand washing. When your hands are visibly soiled, you must wash it with soap and water because we are aware that this virus does not do well with soap. So really, we should wash our hands with soap and water. And then sanitizing is just to augment. Mm. Then it's also really important to ensure continuous cleaning and disinfection of frequently used surfaces. Because again, we are now aware that this virus can survive on surfaces for about four to seven days, depending on whose research you're looking at. So it's really important that high contact areas are cleaned with soap and water first and then disinfected. All right, uh, let's take a look at what has happened in places like South Korea and the U.S., where there have been cases of infections and reinfections from teachers to children in schools, uh, which have caused them, of course, to shut down schools again. I'm just wondering what measures can school owners in Nigeria take to ensure that we don't have such cases of, you know, infection from teacher to children or vice versa? Okay, so in that case, School owners must be strict. For example, before entering into the school premises, you should have a, a policy and even a sign that says no face mask, no entry. Because again, if you are carrying something and the other person is not carrying, and then both of you are not even putting on your face mask, somebody's going to endanger another person, right? So that policy should be there for this for starters. Do not step into the building if you're not even using your face mask. Now, the next thing is. In, in order to reduce contact, you have to reorganize the way things are done in your school. If, for example, in your school prior to now, when children need to have a change of classes, they need to move from the class to go and meet the teacher. This time around, change it such that the teacher has to move in their direction so that we don't, don't have too many people moving and moving. Because many times when children have to move, they're going to move as a pack. And if they're moving as a pack, it means they're not going to be doing social distancing. So you have to Look around your particular school's context. What do you do that can make sure that you are not doing social distancing, that is going to reduce the likelihood of people using their face masks? Readjust your procedures, readjust your systems to ensure that these cardinal principles of social distancing, hand washing, cleaning, and use of face masks 
continues. Mm -hmm. uh, let's also talk about children, you know, um, those who are in preschool and kindergarten, if you like. Experts have said that children under two years of age, uh, age should not wear the face mask since they may not be able to remove them without help. And it could also endanger them. And children with severe breathing problems or cognitive impairments may also have a hard time tolerating a face mask. This kind of puts us in a dilemma. Uh, so I'm wondering, how do school owners of preschool uh, school children or those who have special need manage this reality? On the one hand, we want to protect them from COVID-19. On the other hand, if they wear a mask, uh, somehow we are endangering them. Where do we strike the balance? So this is a very, very important question and that is why knowing your unique context is so important if the school you operate is just a preschool kind of thing then you must know that you do not necessarily have to open the school building you must seek alternative methods of ensuring that knowledge happens still ensuring the basic guidelines because again these guidelines have been researched and we know that that is what is the standard you should or either operate above but never below it so in this case, if you operate a preschool, I saw a school on Instagram who um, does a preschool setting. What they've been doing during the pandemic to give knowledge is to send learning packs to the homes of the children. So that way learning still happens, but then you are reducing that risk of bringing all of them together and putting face masks. Because I mean, if the children are already in their homes, they may not necessarily need to use their face. They may not use the face mask in the house. Mm. So they are within a safe space. So you must consider alternative learning options so that learning still happens. Because the truth is, we should not allow education to stop, even though this is happening. We do not want the children to be kept backwards. I mean, we've already lost some time, but that is okay if we can alternate with what we have. Mm. Lastly, before I let you go, Ugochi, so, some parents have decided to homeschool. You, you were talking about homeschooling earlier, uh, the, uh, you know, homeschooling their children and children also attending classes online. Again, we will still stick on safety measures. What safety measures should these parents, you know, be uh, taking to adhere to even at home to protect the children, not just from the pandemic, you know, but to ensure that the children are safely learning? Because you mentioned creative ways of doing it earlier. Okay. Yes, this is very important. I, I don't know if you remember some months ago when some schools reopened online. And then there were lots of pictures on social media of various children either at the dining table of their homes or using their parents' workstation to take part in this online learning. Now, many times we're going to focus on just the online learning and then forget that there are other things that are important. For example, the learning environment. Is the seat and chair that you have set up for your child to learn safe for their posture? Is it safe for their bodies? Because if a little child is using an adult furniture and because it is not the size of the child, the child gets uncomfortable, begins to twist and turn or assume a wrong posture. And the child is going to be there for hours studying. At some point, there's going to be problems because the child is going to have some bodily discomfort. And if the child maintains that position for hours, weeks, and months, it's a problem. Right. We do not want something else to happen just because you are learning at home. The next one is for their eyes. We do not want also for children's eyes to get strained. And then they also come away with other illnesses just because they are using mobile phones or using laptops. So you must consider the visibility of the learning environment. Uh, is the light too bright? Is it um, hitting against the screen? Is it reflecting back on their eyes? You must consider that. Another thing that is very important to the learning environment, aside the seat and aside visibility, is the arrangement of tasks. So for example, if a child needs to use something for learning, is it all arranged around the child? Or is it when the child needs it? The child has to twist and turn and overreach and all those sort of stuff. So you must make sure that that environment for learning is safe. The child is using the right posture. And then once you have done that, you must now make sure that your child is not exposed to online risk. There are three risks children could be exposed to when they're studying online. The first is contact risk, where all sorts of miscreants might be trying to get in touch with them, either for spamming or for sexting, and, you know, just di di divert their attention, right? Then there is conduct risk. So sometimes children might experience cyberbullying because, again, we're throwing them into a world that some of them were not even prepared for. 
And this is why I always advocate that we must teach children ahead before something comes up. So that when they find themselves in that situation, they are better equipped to act. And then the third risk is content risk. Because again, these children are online and some parents may not necessarily know about putting parental controls on their devices. Okay. They might find themselves on sites they are not supposed to be at. So they might get exposed to traumatizing content or content that is not age appropriate. So these are the things that parents must consider before giving their children um, online tools to learn and say, okay, these are the risks you might encounter, but this is how to avoid it. This is how to stay protected. So once you are certain of your learning environment, you are certain you have put systems in place to ensure that the content, conduct, and contact of people is not affecting your children, then you'll be great.